morning. Welcome to our service at Wendell Christian Church. Let's uh, join me, if you will, please, for our welcome. And we don't turn and greet our neighbors. We do the um, symbol, okay? Welcome. All who are here, welcome. Welcome, my physical, mental, and spiritual self to this moment. Welcome. Together, we willingly, excuse me, welcome, spirit of the risen Christ among us, welcome. Together, we willingly enter communion, one with another, welcome. So for those of you at home, be sure that you have the cup and the bread uh, ready so that you can join us when we have communion later on. And Rob will do the intro at now. You. Before I do the call to worship, I do want to introduce Reverend David Mallory. He doesn't really need an introduction, 
for some of you may be joining us who don't know who he is. I doubt that. He is our guest minister this morning. He is a retired minister from Hillier Memorial Christian Church in Raleigh. He has served in leadership in our region and as uh, interim pastor for a number of churches. He is a mentor to our pastor, Pastor George. We consider him a great friend here at Wendell Christian, and we are very blessed to welcome him to fill our pulpit today. Now, if you will, please join with me in the call to worship. After he was baptized by John, Jesus went by himself to the wilderness where he was tempted. Forty days in the desert, Jesus was tempted to become relevant spectacular, and powerful. Today, we begin to journey with Jesus through the season of Lent, which brings us to face some of our own weaknesses and temptations. Let us worship God and walk the journey together, seeking the Spirit as our guide and companion along the way. Let's bow our head for prayer. O God of heaven and earth, whose spirit stirred over the waters of creation, stir among us this morning, Lord, as we gather for this time of worship. As we gently move into the season of Lent, God, keep our hearts and minds focused on the path ahead, a path that sometimes will involve the agony of a cross, 
the path that always leads to the glory of resurrection life. God, whisper your words of grace. Allow us to brush against your cloak of mercy. Soften our hearts that we might be able to fully receive the message of hope and promise that this season proclaims. God, turn to us now as together we unite our voices with the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we come to the time in our service where we um, update any con prayer concerns. Um, I did get a text from Pastor Joel. And first and the last. You're the one that gives color to the rainbow and warmth to the sunshine. From you, all of our being flow. So God, we come on this Sabbath morning lifting our hearts in praise and thanksgiving to you for all that you are and all that you do in our lives. Holy, 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 you are truly Lord God Almighty. And yet, God, even as you shower us with these many blessings, we confess that too often we have fallen short of the covenant. Too often we have spewed hate instead of practicing love. We have sought vengeance instead of offering forgiveness. We have criticized instead of encouraged, boasted instead of listened, hoarded instead of shared. God, we confess that we have not been true to our call. So Lord, forgive us of our shortcomings. and Do not allow our guilt to cripple us, but allow your grace to inspire us that we might more faithfully live the witness of Jesus Christ. God, we do remember in our prayers this morning those who are consumed by the brokenness of human, play, human life. We remember the frightened and the lonely. We remember the hungry and the homeless. We remember the sick and the dying. We remember those facing crippling addictions, those weary from overwhelming responsibility, those trapped in family conflicts. We remember your church, God, that in these trying times, that we might be that beacon of light that is so badly needed. For God, the one thing we have learned through these months of quarantine is that the church does, does not just happen within the four walls of this sanctuary. The beacon of your grace shines through us wherever and whenever we allow it to shine through us. So God, in this season of Lent, as we make our way toward the glory of that resurrection morning, charge us to go about each day shining our light that others might know of the good news of Jesus Christ. For it is in your precious and holy name that we pray these things. Amen. <clears throat>
you know, what I have been, one of the things I've discovered during this time of quarantine is that I really, I really miss community. I miss being a part of something greater than myself. And that's one of the reasons why coming to the table each week is so life-giving for me. It reminds me that even though we are not in the same space, we are still one. We are all a part of something greater than ourselves. Not because of anything that we have done, but because of what Christ has done for us. Let us then prepare to come to the table this morning by singing our communion hymn in remembrance. heads and pray as our elder Virginia leads us in prayer for the bread. Our Father, we come to your table during this season, Lord, and renew, renewing our thoughts of your suffering as your body was broken for us. You did for us, Lord, what we cannot do for ourselves. Help us be ever mindful. There is no room for prejudice or pride or anything. There is only room for us to bow at the cross, Lord, and receive with great gratitude what you have done for us through the breaking of your body. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and he broke it. And he passed it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, for this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance. No laughing. <laughs> Let us continue then as our elder Marty leads us in prayer for the cup. Heavenly Father, we are reminded that the cup represents the shed blood of your son, Jesus Christ. In the weeks before his death, not even the specter of the cross could cause his faith to waver. While in this Lenten season, give us the honesty to examine what lies within our hearts and minds that separates us from you so that our own faith may be renewed. We have been greatly blessed by your love. Teach us to share that gift freely with others. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. After the dinner was over, 
as was the practice of the day. Jesus took a cup and he filled it with wine and he blessed it and he passed it around to all at the table and he said, drink of it, all of it. For this represents a new covenant. It is a covenant of grace, a covenant of hope, a covenant of promise that is poured out for all persons. Do this in remembrance of me. You know, even as the community is not formally gathering, the work of the church continues. And the church needs the support of the community. And so you are invited this morning to present your tithes and offerings so that we as the church can continue the work that God is calling us out to do. Amen. morning, our scripture passage comes from the Gospel of Luke. We'll be reading today from the third chapter, verses 7 through 17. It is a familiar story, the harsh part of the story of the person we know as John the Baptist. Hear then these words from Luke's Gospel. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, John said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even the tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, teacher, what should we do? He said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what should we do? John said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. Well, as all the people were filled with expectation and were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. May God add his blessing to our understanding and application of this God's sacred word given to us. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our gracious and glorious God, we pray that you would empower the words and thoughts that are presented here this morning in ways that would inspire our hearts, our minds, and our deeds to serve the glory of your eternal kingdom. Amen. When I first stepped wide-eyed into the stately halls of Bright Divinity School in Fort Worth, Texas, I had absolutely no idea what to expect. As a second career seminary student, it had been nearly 20 years since I'd been in a college classroom. So to embark on such an intense regimen of religious study, there was no doubt this was going to be a huge lifestyle shift for me. But you know, it really really turned out it wasn't all that bad. I really enjoyed my time in seminary, and I learned a lot. 
I learned about Irenaeus and his ransom theory of atonement. I learned about Martin Heidegger's philosophy of existentialism. I learned about John Calvin's doctrine of predestination. I mean, this is scintillating stuff we're talking about here. But then post him, when I began to minister to the Billy Bobs and Betty Sues of rural West Texas, I found out that a lot of what I had learned in those ivory tower classrooms was about as helpful as a hearing aid at a NASCAR race. And now don't get me wrong, I, I, do think, I do think a theological education is important for those entering vocational ministry. But it just worries me that our seminaries aren't really teaching good practical skills. Things like how to lead a meeting and how to read a budget and how to deliver a sermon. And they don't teach about technology or administration or probably the most important tool of all, good people skills. But then I guess, I guess this is not really a new problem. Because as we look at this preacher who we know as John the Baptist, it's pretty clear that he didn't learn very much in seminary. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering why the search committee didn't see that. I mean, had I been on that committee, John's papers would have been the first ones we would have tossed. He was a preacher kid, and you know how much trouble they can be. His father, Zechariah, was a priest at the temple in Jerusalem. And like often happens in clergy families, young John had followed his father into the pulpit. But instead of preaching in one of the local congregations, John decides to wander out into the wilderness, taking the gospel message to the region beyond the Jordan River a region filled with, with tent makers and, and fig farmers and sheep herders. And in order for him to fit in in this first century Old West culture, instead of a nice robe with a, with a cross around his neck, John wears a pair of camel hair overalls with a buffalo skin belt wrapped around his waist. I'm telling you, he looks more like Billy the Kid than he does Billy Graham. And so when he steps up in that pulpit, in front of those folks who have never, ever been in a church before. He's not exactly candy to their eyes. Members of the search committee cringe as John shuffles his paper and clears his throat. And well, they should. Because the first words out of John's mouth are not, Hi, my name's John, and I'm delighted to be in ministry with you. Instead, the first words out of his mouth are, You brood of vipers! Not exactly the way to ensure a long tenure, is it? I had a colleague one time, about as smart as any preacher that you'd ever want to meet. He was fluent in Greek and Hebrew. He could quote any scripture passage from memory. He could unpack the writings of all the great theological writers in history. He was, he was absolutely brilliant except that what he hadn't learned. What he hadn't learned was to how to effectively navigate the sometimes sensitive waters of church life. On his first Sunday in a rather large suburban congregation, he stood before the gathering of followers and he said to them, some of you are not going to like me, and that's okay. But I'm not leaving. So if you don't like me, you might as well make plans now to leave. Not exactly a good way to ensure a successful team, is it? You brood of vipers, John barks at this stunned crowd. You say to yourself, we have Abraham as our ancestor. But I tell you, from these very stones, God can raise up ancestors. Now you may remember. You may remember back in the beginning in the book of Genesis, when God was first looking around for a chosen people, God, God came to a, a fellow named Abram. I will make you into a great nation, God promised him. I will bless you and those around you and the people of the earth will be blessed through you. And then God changed Abram's name to Abraham. And God went about the task of building a community that God could be in covenant with forever. Through Abraham, God liberated the people from their bondage in Egypt. 
Through Abraham, God led them to the land of milk and honey. Through Abraham, God established the reigns of great kings like Solomon and David. Through Abraham, God rescued the people from the hands of their Babylonian captives. Through Abraham, God promised a Messiah, a Savior, who would reestablish the nation to a place of power and prominence. Through Abraham, the Hebrew people were moved right to the front of the line. that's what these folks in the crowd are banking on this morning. We have Abraham as our ancestor, they boast to John. Don't you know? We're the chosen ones, the favored ones. Man, nanny, boo-boo, we're the teacher's pet. In my fourth grade class, Claire Lindsay sat right in front of me. Now, you know Claire Lindsay. She was in your fourth grade class, too. For reasons unbeknownst to the rest of us, she had endeared herself to Mrs. Fredrickson. And she got all the perks that were privy to that position. She got to deliver the paperwork to the office while the rest of us were stuck in class trying to memorize our division tables. She got to sit next to the window while all the rest of us had to sit in alphabetical order. She was always the one that got to run the projector when we'd watch a film strip. She was the teacher's pet. You know, I guess, I guess that wouldn't have been so bad. Except, except that she was so doggone arrogant about it. With a sort of holier-than-thou attitude. She was a descendant of Abraham. And she wanted to make sure everybody knew it. I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering if, if that's the kind of attitude that's spewing from the congregation that John is gathered for before this morning. I'm sure there's no question that they are descendants of Abraham, and I certainly don't want to be critical of their good fortune. But maybe, maybe do you think, uh, like my mother used to say, do you think maybe they've gotten a little bit too big for their britches? Oh, no need to serve the poor, they convince themselves. And no need to visit the sick, no need to clothe the naked. God has appointed us as the chosen people. But haven't we seen, haven't we seen over and over and over again how that sort of entitlement tears away the fabric of the community. A number of years ago, I was in charge of a ministry that collected toys and gave them to families who could not otherwise afford toys for their Christmas. And I'll never forget one day, one day a woman came up to me with a box full of McDonald's premium. You know, the, those toys that you get when you buy a kid's meal from a fast food joint? I told my children to save these. She proudly smiled at me. I told them we'd get them some good toys and give these to the poor kids. Now, I don't think she was trying to be insensitive. I really do believe that she had good intentions. But her words reeked of a, I'm better than you. I'm holier than you. I'm a descendant of Abraham kind of attitude. When the, when the two brothers went to Jesus and asked for favored seats in the kingdom, don't you remember how angry and resentful the other disciples were at their deceptiveness? When the, when the prodigal son demanded his inheritance so he could go out and sow his oats, don't you remember how his family was thrown into a state of chaos and confusion? When the CEO of the company budgets himself a 10% increase, how do you think the frontline workers feel when their health insurance is cut from them? When the star quarterback gets an extra week to work on his term paper, how do you think the other students feel about spending all night doing research in the library? 
When the national leader takes his family on a vacation to Mexico, how do you think his constituents feel when they don't have any power or any water? Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I don't think the faithful are out to be malicious. Just because your grandpa owns an oil well doesn't make you a bad person. They are the descendants of Abraham. And they're just trying to get what's due to them. They come this morning filled with expectation, the text says. John, John, you're the one they eagerly beg. You're the Messiah. Go ahead, John. Do your magic. We're the descendants of Abraham, and we're ready for you to shower us with the blessings that God has promised. That would have been real easy. It would have been real easy for John just to climb up on his throne of righteousness. It would have been real easy for him to swell with a kind of holier than thou attitude. But he didn't. Instead, John offers a lesson for Lent. A lesson that goes completely against this self-righteous, egocentric culture that we live. I baptize with water, John says, but one more powerful than I is coming. And I am not worthy to even untie his sack. You see, I think, I think what John is trying to teach us this morning is that true community, true community begins with humility. Let's bow our heads. Father God, forgive us our times of selfish arrogance. Forgive us, God, those times when we feel as if blessings are owed to us. Anchor within each of us, God, a deeper sense of gratitude, a deeper sense of humility that we might recognize the gift of grace that's given to us. and That in turn, we might share that abundant grace with others. Amen. Our hymn of commitment this morning is number 666. We'll be singing The Voice of God is Called.
now, if you would, receive the benediction. As you go without these walls, leave here your sorrows and your cares. In their stead, take faith, hope, and love. These three, for they're thine. And from within your heart, great living altars raise, that you may know God and live at last with God forevermore. Amen. Thank you again, Reverend Mallory. Thank you. Uh, now we will uh, have a time of announcement. Some of you received your email about giving comments to the board. We'll be meeting Wednesday night to discuss um, returning to our sanctuary. So please share your thoughts and opinions. Are there any other announcements or things that we need to mention this morning? All right, thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. All right, you too. We will.